Foster Car Finance, proud sponsors of the Awali Farmerland podcast. Haha, <laughs> it's right, lad. Hello and welcome back to the How Are We Farmland podcast with me, Andy Hazard Dickens. Yes, and our special guest today is Brian Sumner. <laughs> hi, hi, Brian. How are we, John? Hey! I'm all right, so are you? <laughs> right. I've got to tell you, I'm so excited. Like I, I just said to you guys earlier, I've been over in America for 26 years and I've done so many podcasts and TV things and the rest. And when John May from down the street, who I grew up with, said, jump on this podcast, I'm like, to be here with you guys is going to be funny. It so is. I'm good. It's very early, but I'm good. It's, so thank it, you guys. It's 6 o'clock. It's 6 a.m. Where you are, isn't it? 6.06, and I'm in the kitchen. Yeah, got up early for some scallies. <sighs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, let me tell you about, like, Brian. So me and Brian were friends when we were kids, right? Brian lived in Hale Roads. I lived in Macon Street. I loved your mum, Brian, as well. Absolutely loved your mum. Thank um, you. And we used to get collect frogs, didn't we? We did frogs and newts and toads from uh, the farm, right? Yeah, Rice Lane Farm. We used to get the newts. Brian was like, Brian knew exactly what he was doing. We used to get the fire-bellied newts. We used to go to Morton for the frogs at Cadbury's. But yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so Brian grew up on County Road, didn't you? Yep. And um, when he was 16... He got off to America on his own. Yeah. So tell us about your childhood first, Brian, in Liverpool. You know what? Um, I've got to say it. Like, I've been here for 26 years, so the Scousers there, anyone I grew up with, they're going to be like, this guy sounds so American. Yeah. But what they say is if you lived somewhere for, say, 12 to 14 years, you keep that accent. So right about the time I came to America, I have this partial Liverpool accent and then very, you know, Yank. Oh, my nice. wife's American. My kids are American. So people are going to be laughing because I'm a mutt. But I'll tell you, I grew up, yeah, John, I mean, a couple blocks, streets down from John May. And uh, I just, I love Liverpool, you know. And then about the age of 13, I picked up a skateboard. And we'll jump into that in a sec. But, um, yeah, I just love Liverpool. But what I remember of it was just, it was rough. It was tough. And me and you connected earlier. I remember Anthony Gower and those kids, you all play games together. Yeah, yeah. But I just remember Liverpool going to Arnott Street, then not going to All Sops because I'd got in so many fights. I didn't want to deal with going there and getting into more. And I went to Hillside. But um, I love Liverpool. You know, I mean, the Beatles, the football, growing up on County Road, just so many people. And as you said about my mom, she just invited everyone into our home. We had a load of friends. We all hung out. So... I mean, you can go wherever today. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's fresh on my mind, even though I've been here for 26 years. I'm 41. Mm. So, yeah. Ah, cool. So I, when I remember when you were a kid, you were into like, you were into like, you, you were into, uh, you loved Bruce Lee. You were, what is it called? Is it Win, Win, Win Chung? She couldn't do, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. you went off to do that as well, didn't you? Did you become a black belt in that? No, not as much in that, but you know, and I've got to say it, John, because you're talking about Liverpool. You know, you, you, Liverpool's very fight or flight. You go up and and people, they love you, but they can get in your face. So I got into a lot of fights as a kid for whatever reason. And so my dad naturally had me, you know, hitting a punching bag and then the fascination with Bruce Lee. And I think I did some Wing Chun and Ninjitsu in, um, what do you call it? The Baths of Stanley Road or Everton Valley. And I went Everton. and did a load of that. Everton Sports Centre. The sports center, and, and I remember going there, you might remember, and they had that Kung Fu arcade game, and you go in there and waste all your money and go swimming. <laughs> and then I go back on Sunday, and then, you know. <laughs> That's where you go when you run, isn't it? Yeah, I've had many fights in there, Everton Park. It's going to be weird for someone, you are, yeah? yeah, yeah. It's going to be weird for someone to, like, wear an American accent to be so relatable to the places where we're from. Oh, it's mad. Oh, yeah. It's mad, yeah. Did you play football or anything, Brian? Did you play for the local team or anything? You know what? I... I Played, it's funny because here they obviously call it, you know, um, soccer, but it's called football. Yeah. I played for, was it under 10s, under 11s, under 12s, the Chelsea, you know, and was it, what was the other one? The one on County Road. And I played with everyone, like Liam Whelan and that whole crew. Uh, was it Michael Cloessy? I played with all those kids growing up. And we just went all over, you know, Liverpool and places. And uh, that was, I mean, I didn't care about it that much. But it was just fun being around everyone. So I played, but man, it wasn't until I got a bit older and then, you know, skateboarding was what I fell in love with. 
So, yeah. I, there was a, I don't know, <laughs> like coming from like from County Road, coming from Walton, I mean, everyone's into footy or maybe boxing or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. If someone is have had a skateboard on County Road when I was a kid, yeah. you know the score, Brian. It's been like, what are you doing with a fucking skateboard? So what well, happened? that's what they said. Yeah, what <laughs> happened? Well, you know, I'm just going to get real. I, you know, I say fight or flight because you guys don't even realize this, right? Um, if you go, uh, John, I remember you came over to LA last time we were trying to connect, but if you come to Huntington and you go walk down the street with me, no one walks up to you and says, what are you looking at? What's your problem? <laughs> what kind of that's that? What the bleep? What the F? What's this? You guys are laughing because that's Scallies. Yeah. The times I got in trouble with the police here, the guys in Huntington will get out their truck. They'll walk over and ask you if you got a problem. And you guys both know, what do you do when someone gets in your face? <laughs> you either run away or you headbutt them. <laughs> Liverpool is crazy. So I'm saying like, I was used to this kind of background of fight or flight, you know, footy um, growing up there. And I said, I'm saying it to say this, I got in so many fights at Arnott Street that as the time we were going to go to uh, Allsop, you know, whoever was one of the toughest guys in the school, they would go and all get in fights. I was like, I don't want to get into this. Kids were starting to do acid and, you know, their older brothers were starting to like do smack. And I was like, this is crazy. Dude, John, you know what I was like? I was just a mellow kid in the house, like with the frogs and the Ninja Turtles doing my thing. And, <laughs> and so I went to Hillside and this is funny because we all know this in England. You know, you guys definitely know that all happened where, you know, the WWF came in, the Simpsons came in and then that movie Police Academy 4 came in, all the Police Academy films. So in that movie, they were skateboarding. There's me, you know, buck teeth and a bowl head and braces on County Road. And I seen this skateboard and I fell in love. And um, I'd gone to Hillside, a couple of the kids skated. And for whatever reason, I'm telling you, it honestly felt like a way to get out of either just going to a bunch of raves and yeah. people starting to do, you know, acid and ecstasy. And I was just freaked out. Like, I don't want to get into it. And you know what's funny? It's funny now. I'm trying to slow down what I'm saying because I'm thinking they won't understand me, but all the scousers will be right there because we talk fast. But it was almost like those Bruce Lee movies, how I never seen him drink. I mean, he drunk a bit in them, but I never seen him smoke and I never seen him getting into drugs. So I kind of was like, I, I was just obsessed with Bruce Lee. I didn't want to get into it. So there I am, like going to that school, picking up a skateboard and that just became me life. But I remember the pants were baggy. You had funny beanies on, long shirts. And kids would be saying like, what the bleep are you? What are you doing? What, look at him. And they were kids I knew. Yeah. But you know, John, I knew everyone. Yeah. I knew all the kids that got in a fight. I knew all the kids who were crazy. Um, so no one really messed with me like that. I was just, there's Brian. Yeah. And then you fast forward a few years and like you're like, wait, what's... I mean, John, I moved to America when I was 15 and a half. I wow. finished school in Hillside. I went to uh, John Moore's in town for art school for like six months. And then I got invited to go to America and that was it, you know? So, so. you see the potential like with everyone else who we saw to, well, not everyone, but you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. you've seen you've seen a road that you thought, oh, I'm, this road might be bad. So you just steered off into your own direction. So tell us, I Brian. Did, yeah. Oh, tell us, so... What created this opportunity at 15 and a half to go to America on your own? Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, you mentioned me mom, you know, and, and obviously she's been passed, you know, a few years now. Like I just seen the post of your mom, you know, rest in peace, you know, beautiful ladies. But um, they just, I don't know. I was never that crazy kid. I mean, I did well in school. Yeah, I got into plenty of fights and, I, you know, hanging out at the Seven Sisters with ferrets or off in <laughs> West Kirby, you know, we'd smash the occasional window and whatever, go into Lila's, you know, on bonfire night. I mean, I love Liverpool. I have a very vivid memory, but it was like skating at 13. I go into the city center, you know, where all those people skate. Now for two or three years, I'm around guys who are 18, 19, 20, 30. Yeah. We're traveling around England together. So I kind of grow up fast. And meanwhile, I don't want to disrespect Liverpool, you know, because because Huntington Beach, I mean, it's got enough drugs and craziness and there's enough route, the kind of the meathead MMA attitude that used to be here, you know. Um, so it isn't just Liverpool, it's life. But skating was kind of this way out. And I think my mom's seen the discipline I had, seen a guy called Jeff Rowley, who's probably the most one of the most famous skaters from England, definitely Liverpool, seen him having a career and skating was taken off. And so I just did it. It gave me the discipline. 
And for whatever reason, I got to 15 and, you know, I'd won a bunch of competitions. I jumped downstairs. I was in the city center every day. I mean, I'd get down to Kirkdale station, get the train. I'd skate six, seven hours a day. And then I got offered by some of these companies. Do you want to ride for us? And at 15, 16, John, for whatever reason, um, it just all worked out. So it's crazy. It went from like, you know, and, and I, and you, you when we know, John, we could name people right now that we were friends with or I maybe got punched with or a fight with that are in prison now that I think, man, their lives went a certain way. Yeah. I don't know what it would have worked out like for me. I just couldn't imagine going into certain lifestyles, you know what I mean? And then seeing it unfold like that. So it makes sense looking back. So When, when you first picked up your skateboard, Brian, how did you know you was any good? Because obviously in Liverpool, the, the skateboard, it's not it's not big. We don't know. We can't. We've got no yeah. standards to judge by. How did you know you were good? You know, well, you'll remember both of you just probably had those 10 pound skateboards with the crappy plastic wheels <laughs> or the little funny shit. You know, when we go down the church in our road, down the street in that, and um, it didn't really work. So I just got into it. And you know what it was? I think, I mean, John will say, you know, it, it's me being obsessed. That's all I did. So you do something long enough for as many hours as you can. I'm now doing that. I'm jumping downstairs. I'm getting noticed. I'm going into town. And it just started working. And I remember reading in a magazine and it said possibility of you getting sponsored, you know, like, like to anyone reading it, you know, so many thousand and one. And for me, like I said, you know, I'm watching Married with Children. I'm, um, I'm watching the things on TV. America's got the smooth ground and the red curves. And you you probably, you, I think, you know, Andy Cavana, John, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, we all went to school. I mean, the way I met Andy Cavana was we would shower each other across the road from him over County Road. I remember where the Aldi is. We're swearing each other one day, and we were like 12 or 13. We got in this fight coming back from uh, the footy one time, me and him, and then we became friends. But one of the things Cav would do is he'd always just mess with people, and they just called me an American from the moment I went, like, he's an American, you know, like joking, but being friends. Yeah, yeah. Like just taking digs at you. So I just looked to America because- Because you embraced that's that where culture. The, you love that culture. Yeah, and it's not because America, but it was like, that's where you skate. That's where you get sponsored. And here's how it works. You know, there's, a, like you said, there's a limited amount of, of skate magazines out and videos and whatever. So it's kind of like it's all family. Who's this kid from Liverpool? I'm getting noticed. I'm getting, I mean, you know, you imagine being a skater and you open a box- of four skateboards and you're just loving it. And then that took off and, and two guys like Tony Hawk and that video game, it just blew up. I mean, listen, they say right now today that music and skateboarding are the most influential things in America. Is so you look at right the style, now, yeah. what people wear. Well, yeah, because, because it did everything. I don't know now for back in Liverpool, the way, you know, we all had our trackies and everyone had their sovereign rings and the shakes. <laughs> shaved heads back then <laughs> but you know and john you gotta dig into me you gotta like what am i missing from liverpool now you know because i know we're like back to where we were oh, but wow. i just picture like skinheads with trackies and and then just kids who were more reserved as well so <laughs> and I, it's definitely changed from since we were kids i mean everyone's a lot more open minds and i want to suppose it's over there as well it's like you see different groups you see like i don't know yeah. it was lgbt world day you yeah. seen all kids you know obviously we're still in school and they all yeah. had the flags and stuff like that. It's like, so they all these a lot more open-minded groups. So it's definitely different from when we were kids. But um, yeah, like, so what I heard of Brian is like, you just vanished, but we weren't really mates at that time. So, because you were a skateboarder and I was yeah, probably doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, John, you were always a good kid. And I mean that like, that you just connected yeah. and we just did our thing. You know what I mean? And so I think we both had yeah. hyper focus, Brian. I think that's, we both definitely zoom in on something and that's it. Yeah. But yeah. then I, um, I hadn't heard from you and stuff like that. And like, I, you know, you're there, oh, Brian, somebody just go board now in America. It's like, oh, is he? Yeah, fucking hell. And then when social media come out, I went, I was sitting there one day and I went, Brian, somebody. And I looked you up. I was like, no fucking way. And I remember, is it Adio? That's who you were sponsored by. I thought he's got his own brand of trainees. He's, we were on the Tony Hawks game as well. Were you yeah, on they put a bunch of stuff in there, but you know. I was it, like, wow, this is like... mad. But anyway. What's that? And I was going, this, no. fuck, this is mad. And that's when we sort of reconnect us, wasn't it? It was. And you know, it's funny because even mum and dad would say, you know, what's going to happen? It, I was at an event in England probably like three years ago. And it's this massive big event. And this guy comes up to me and he goes, do you remember me? And I go, 
yeah, where did we meet? And he was like, well, we went to art school together. And I only went to art school so I could be in town, get the bacon sausage sarnies, you know, next to the place when I'm done at 12 o'clock and go skate all night till seven till my dad would pick me up. And I'm 15, 16. But he goes, I remember being in art school and the teacher saying something to you. And you just said to him, you know, I'm not even going to be here next year. I'm leaving. I'm going to America. And he goes, are you sure about that? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, I just, he goes, Brian, you just stood up and closed the desk and walked off. And we never seen you again. Really? And then in six months, you're on the cover of a magazine. And not because I'm great, but it's like, that's how close I was to it. So, yeah. I mean, and if you said, how does this work? Let's say all three of us are skating and we go get sponsored. They send you some boards. I happen to stand out with the accent and who Jeff Rowley was getting me sponsored. I go over to Huntington Beach, which was skateboard mecca. You're getting a couple of hundred dollars a month, but you're living in an apartment with some of the most known skaters ever. Is this when you first Henry. went over, Brian, at 15 So this is what it's like. Let's say us three go over there as amateurs. This American company rents you an apartment. You're all living together. You're skating all day. You're going to the jacuzzi all night and barbecuing. Photographers and filmers are taking photos of you. And we're doing what we love. It's like you doing 15 podcasts today. You're going to love it. You know, you're having fun. You guys are goofing off together. And now skating takes off. And so now you have a board sponsor. And they might say, well, John, I want to give you $2,000 a month. You ride the skateboards. It goes everywhere. And if you sell more, you're making three or four grand. Then you have a shoe sponsor. Yeah. You could be getting five grand a month. Then you have a clothing sponsor. You're getting seven grand a month. So you're making... 10, 12, 15, $20,000 a month. Then you have a pro shoe. I mean, there's there's years you're getting $200,000, $300,000 at 19, 20, 21. Because, and here's the thing, I'm a little booked with Brian from County Road, but in America, you've got black, you know, my hair is dyed black. Uh, I'm just listening to certain kinds of music. And skating is like a religion. I'm going to go film a video part for two years then it comes out. There's a limited amount of, you know, it's like the World Cup. It comes out once every four years. You put a video out, goes all over the world. So everyone's watching it and then they buy the clothes you wear. And, you know, and John, it's to the point where you're going to LA and like these famous actors and actresses, John Fogarty, or even people like Dana White, you know, and all these people, their kids are in the skating and they want to be around and they're doing stuff. And so, it just, it, it's funny, like the, the most famous people you can imagine, their kids love skating. So yeah, you yeah. get pulled into this world and you're like the cool person, which, you know, we're all just goofing off doing what we love anyway. So yeah, it's crazy. See, that's amazing. <laughs> so where, where does it take you? I mean, like what was, the, you, you You probably got yourself in some like city, because I remember you saying to me, you, you were yeah. started mixing with like really big names and stuff like that. So what was that like yeah, being up there, Brian? It just, it just opens the doors, you know, and, and you know, um, I feel like we're very grounded in Liverpool and yeah, there's interesting things that happen and all the rest, but you see through all the, you know what, the BS. And so you're just over here and, you know, let's say it's the three of us skating again, you're riding for Tony Hawk's companies. You show up to a skate park on a $150,000 bus, you know, at a skate park, there's 7,000 people there. At a skate event, you're signing things all day. You're skating for hours. As videos go around the world, all these famous people are bringing their kids. So I say that to say you get enough of the, the fame bubble to know it's not relevant. You know, you're, you're going to like an MTV event where you're skating yeah. Yeah. and it's like Gwen Stefani or No Doubt, you know, or, or Jennifer Lopez or all these people are there. And for me, what it did, and I'm, I'll say this, John, because I was just always on this truth journey, you know, the whole, I don't know, for whatever reason, I got to give a shout out, you know, to Shaolin World right there. What is it? The bottom of the church on, what was that, Bold Street? Oh, yeah. I remember going into Shaolin World and they had a Bruce Lee book, The Tao of Jeet Kune Do. And Bruce took all these influences of Eastern philosophy and he just said, you know, it's like a sculptor who tears away the clay till the truth's revealed. I viewed skateboarding as the way to figure out truth because I was afraid to enter contests. I'm going to jump down 15 stairs on a skateboard. That's scary. That's like going into a fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I'm getting down to the truth. Now I'm in America and I'm seeing all these people and their wealth and their status. And I'm trying to figure out truth. And that's when I'm 19, 20. So I was just like, I was on this journey, which I kind of feel like you've always been on that journey, John, the conversations we've had, you know, yeah, and def definitely. And I'm, I'm still on it now. Now we're, we're we can gonna... do our heads in, but we got to ask those questions and be, you know, 
let's be real, whether you're from Liverpool or Huntington Beach, um, an actor, actress or not, whatever it is, we should be thinking about what life's about. We should be looking around and saying, is, is footy or skateboarding or whatever the extent of, of what's here? They're the bigger questions that we don't really ask anymore. Yeah. You so know, you've got so. to experience all that to see what was left really and what was important. Well, so, it's psychological. If I took you two out of school at 15, we go to America. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that come here and they have nervous breakdowns because John, if I broke my ankle, I'm going home. Yeah, I yeah. wasn't a citizen. Three months, three months back, six months, six months back. And then I became a citizen, so I've been here ever since. When you say that you're mixing with these people on, on the outer edge of the celebrity web, Brian, was this confusing for you? Because you can all, almost like try to keep up with the Joneses, can't you? Yeah, and that's a good term, like keeping up with the Joneses, because skating, but, but you know, skating's not like that. It's kind of like uh, getting in the gym and whether it's like Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, you figure out who you are quick, you know, what works, what can I do? So, I mean, you know, you're going to an event in Beverly Hills because there's a skate thing and a charity. And a guy walks over to you. He's like, oh, would you mind coming to my house and, and skating, you know, with my kids? And you look over and it's John Fogarty from Cleden's Clearwater Revival, you know, Bad Moon Rising. So you're around these people and they're like with hundreds of millions of dollars and achieved it all and whatever else so you're seeing it. And I'm only saying that because it's cool way on your dad. And you're like, oh, I met this person. I seen this person. Yeah, I'm yeah. connecting with them. But, you know, at 19, 20, it's interesting. But as we all get older, even for you guys, I mean, you guys, I mean, you, you, life hits you in a way where you have to facilitate it. And either you medicate or you grab for other things or you kind of just steer and see what's going on. So, and also here's the thing, skating is you've got to be dedicated. I mean, kids get sponsored and before you know it, they're spending all this money, they're hooked on a substance and it's like it disappears. So I was like, I'm not a citizen yet. I can't get too distracted. I mean, I went up to LA and goofed off with a lot of stuff and was around a lot of people, but I just, I don't know. I just always, I felt like even Liverpool helped me be cautious. You know, there's times when you're walking downtown where you better shut your mouth. It's going to kick off. You have to, you know, you got to read a situation. So I was, I was cautious, but yeah. <laughs> so, so um, like you're known for something quite different from skating now, aren't you? Rather than, Obviously, you're still heavily involved in your skating and stuff like that. So your life took a bit of a turn, didn't it, Bri? Could you tell mm -hmm. us what led up to that point? Well, yeah. I mean, if you'd have called me then, John, and said, you know, here's Brian Sumner down the street, you know, when whatever AOL or something came out. He's in America. He's doing well. He's going around the world. And, and it wasn't like a cheesy look at what I did. I was still like, man, life's crazy. I, I love skating. It's fun. I, all these amazing people. And so then because everything's worked out, you know, you're on the cover of the magazines, you're in the videos. I, you know, I was around girls. I had a couple of girlfriends in Liverpool. I didn't really chase women, you know what I mean? But then in Huntington, again, Jeff Rowley, who any skater listen, and most people from Liverpool would know who he is. And through him, I met a girl from where she worked and we began to connect. We were together for four months. I was about to go back to England. And I was like, man, I can't even picture being away from this girl. She said the same thing. So here we are just being crazy. Our families, you know, I'm Italian and Mexican. And I feel like my family's pretty rowdy at times, you know? So we're like, hey, um, we didn't tell anyone. Let's just get married. We drove out to Vegas, got married, and pretty much got pregnant. And so there's Brian, you know, making a bunch of money, living in America, married to this girl. And we didn't just do it for visa reasons. I mean, we loved each other. And then here I am, you know, with money in the bank on the covers of magazine. I'm saying this to sell the idea of look where I am, you know, yeah, like, yeah. like I've made this life. And so I'm married. I have a son. Everything's going great. And I'm like, man, I'm living the American dream. So it looked great. But here's the reality, John. At 1920, you haven't really faced a lot of you know what. You're kind of like, you're kind of green. I'm just like, we just went into this marriage and we're trying to make it work. You went and, reinforced and, and prepared to deal with what you you had yeah. at that time yeah you had well, to how many conversations did we have about marriage me and john may we ever like oh let's when we get married no we're just like here's this scale here's what we're gonna do here's life and and you know what does disney sell us happily ever after so you marry someone and you go in wanting to make it work wanting to do what's right giving your best but we also carry all these issues with us anyway so how's that marriage gonna work out you know we're, we're living in a strange and fallen world i mean it's beautiful 
It's 6.30 a.m. and I'm motivated to be up. But I'm but I'm, I'm tired. I'm going to get my <laughs> butt kicked when I go to jiu-jitsu today because of it. So, <laughs> But yeah, tell us. So I remember you yeah. telling a story about when you were working in a... I don't know whether you were frustrated or you were questioning a lot of things, but you're working yeah. in a bookstore. Yeah. <laughs> well, everyone listening, like you went from skating to working in a bookstore. What no, but you volunteered was... in the bookstore, didn't you? What's that? Did you volunteer in the bookstore? Oh, yeah. Well, well, here's what happened. So, and this is why scousers, all you scallies, listen, and this is what, <laughs> what it is, you know, and I say that with um, affirmation, just a love for Liverpool. But so we're married for, you know, what well, we have a son, life's going forward. We're a year in, two years in. And before long, you know, you're fighting with someone. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm from Arnott Street to Hillside, skateboarding worked out, money came in. I don't want a lot from people. I just want to be me and do what I'm doing. <laughs> And wait, this marriage, we're fighting now. Did I marry the right person? What's going on? And so before long, we're fighting. We're thinking this isn't the right person. Within two years of being married, John, we're getting divorced and separated. And we we, we loved each other, but there was times we'd fight where we'd hate each other. And so there I am going to get divorced. And here's what happens. I got an eight fights, eight fights in a month, full on fist fights. I'm not a citizen yet. I'd be somewhere, someone would say something. I never started them. I was depressed and angry because I'm getting divorced from this woman. I didn't want to, but I did want to. Now I get community service. I'm still making all this money. And when I go to the judge, he's like, you need to go do community service. You need anger management. Why? Because of all of you scallies in Liverpool who made me get in a fight as a kid on County <laughs> Road, where when someone's in your face, you don't really question. And in America, they're like, what are you going to do? I'm going to do this. Well, and then they're like, what are you doing? You just told me, you, I've been getting my face kicked in, um, in in Liverpool. You know, so I'm saying that to say that passive aggressive fight or flight that all, all of you guys know what I'm talking about. The community service was a bookstore. And so as I'm looking down the list at the very bottom, it says Christian thrift store. And, and what John, I mean, did we even know about God, talk about God, think about God? We grew up next to a massive church in Hale Road. No one ever really talked to me about God. Most of our schools are named Saint this and Saint that, but we don't have an idea about it. Yeah. We have biased ideas to the church. So I'm like, you know what? The thrift store is going to have cool clothes and funky stuff. There's going to be a bunch of old people. I'll go do community service there. And so I show up and I have to do it for like seven months because I'm still traveling. So the judge allowed, it's basically like, like a probation, you know, you go do it and it's like, okay, you'll get in more trouble if you do stupid stuff like getting in the fights and whatever else. And so I went to a bookstore and it was all these Christians. So I don't know if you want to chime in there and say perspective on that to start. So no, I, did you say you were sort of buzzing off them at first? Well, I mean, what, you know what, you, let, let's go get on a train ride with a bunch of Christians. I mean, what do we even know about it? Here's, here's how Liverpool is. England is. We can talk about Ouija boards and, you know, tea leaves and sorcery, but you talk about like God or nah, we don't know what to think. Yeah. We could talk about you. I mean, I always put God, John, in the Bigfoot category or the UFO category because I'm like, who's God <laughs> anyway? You know, is it like on The Simpsons where you go up the escalator and there's St. Peter and it's like me and Homer are like, oh, I guess there's a God. That's all we knew. Um, and, and and you hear crazy things about the church and what they do to kids and they want your money and all these men that can't have wives. And I was like, you know, I'm coming into this with the Bruce Lee philosophy, Eastern mindset of like Zen and karma and this kind of new agey even. I, so, yeah. I, 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 found, <laughs> I found God myself, but I, I, I live two miles away from you. I found, yeah. I found my, God, my God at the age of 18. And it, yeah. was, it was that alien to me and where I was from. When I went back to the area, one of my mates asked me, was a gay? Because mm. he somehow assumed that he, he, I don't know where, didn't make sense to me, but that's what he thought because I was going to church. I was gay. It, it just doesn't make, yeah. Doesn't so so because you were going to church, he thought you were gay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that just tells you like, I mean, but look at it. On our, what is it, 10 pound note, we have Charlie Darwin. So we're raised with this idea of like, we're just animals, we're just whatever. So I wasn't looking for all this, but when you hit rock bottom and you're like, you know what? Um, I've, and listen, it wasn't like I was out there floating by myself. I didn't have people that love me, but there's just days when you got to go, what is going on? You know what I mean? And I was like, where's the truth? 
And I had a, and John, you know, we both have families that love those. We were around amazing people. But yeah, so you ended up going to so, church and, the, and someone asked you if you were gay because you went to church. <laughs> oh, no. This is one thing about religion and God's right with me. And you know, because yeah. I've always questioned it, Brian, you know, I have and I always spoke to you about it and stuff like that. But yeah. I've known Brian since I was a kid and whatever Brian focuses on, Brian achieves. Brian's like, I've always regarded Brian as like really intelligent and I respect what he says. Oh, thanks, John. So I've always thought, and it has always been in the back of my mind. So I struggle, but I go, that can't be real. But then there's this, and then there's this, but that makes sense. That doesn't make sense, blah, 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 blah. But then I, yeah. always, I do think, but Brian believes it. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I know, but no, but it does. It's like, well, Brian's not thick. Yeah. Brian, I know you will look at every avenue. <laughs> and, you, and you'll, and I'm right, you know what I mean? But then you talk, I told you I had an experience, and I still question yeah. that. Um, yeah. But you were at the book, I remember you telling me yeah. you were at the bookstore, and you were, yeah. out, you were questioning them, weren't you? Were you questioning well, here's them, the thing, right? It is we have to, and again, the reason I quoted Bruce, Bruce, Bruce earlier is because this idea of Kung Fu, you know, it's originally the idea of Kung Fu. And, you know, you guys know the parable. We go out to the woods and there's the old samurai and he's sitting there eating his, you know, udon noodles. And we want to go start a fight with him. And he catches the fly with his chopsticks. I don't think I want to go fight that guy today. Because if he can do that with his chopsticks... What can he do with his fists? So he's been through something where he's established yeah, yeah. and that's his going through expression. So for me with skating, Bruce used to say his martial art was a vehicle that taught you about yourself. So to me, it was skating. I'm going to go kickflip the stairs in the Echo building, land on my back. I'm going to do it a different way till I get it right. I'm going to go to the cop and these players from wherever are going to jump me. I'm going to go in the other way. I'll come back with 50 more of my friends. So when it came to faith, I was like, I'm divorced from this woman. I'm angry. I'm considering life. Okay. And here's the thing. Here's what I literally thought. If we just evolved, if I'm just depressed, if I'm, I don't want to be divorced. I don't want to see her with someone else going to the baseball game with my kid. I don't want to deal with another wife and all this stuff. I just didn't want to deal with it. I'm going to prove if God's real or not, because if he's not, nothing matters. If there's no God, John, and if we just evolved and we're just living as what they call in America roadkill. You know, the cat's going to get run over. You're the bug that you step on. If we just evolved and no one made us, nothing matters. I love the podcast. I love skating. I love jujitsu. I love my kids. But at the end of the day, it's survival of the fittest and who cares? And that's where you have to start and say, does anything else in life talk about that? Who is God? What does God say? Are there 300 million Hindu gods? And so back to your point about me, it was that Bruce Lee stripping away or the learning, the skating. Okay, I'm going to this Christian thrift store. Let's see if, if God's real. And so by beginning to look at all these different things, I mean, we can go into a great discussion if you guys want, because here's the ultimate thing, though, is God himself, if we're talking about the God of the Bible, he makes certain things clear to a person. Then they come to faith and they believe him. But there's many other gods and ideas out there. So... I guess the idea is, and here's how I put it to anyone, there can only be one truth. Like either I'm Brian or not, either this is a podcast or not. And no matter what a person says, that is true. I don't believe anything to be true. Well, that statement itself, you obviously believe that. So there is one truth. And what I mean by this to you guys is either you were created or not. Either someone birthed you. I know it's your mom and I know all the stuff of how it came to be, but either all of us were created or not. And that's where I started. And that began to unfold down all these trails. Okay, are there supposedly 40,000 documents for the Bible? Is it the most historic book that's ever been created? I mean, that the God ever spoke? It, geography, history, all these different faiths. And, 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 you know, you might not realize it, but coming from Liverpool, I mean, what, what did we get voted? One of the most influential cities in Europe, the most cultured Eclectic religions, yeah. lots of faith, you know, black, white, brown, whatever color we all are, everything's there. So I had to sit and say, I'm over living. If I was in Texas and I wanted guns, I probably would have took my life. I'm going to prove there's no God because if there's no God, I don't need to be here. If I take my life. Doesn't matter. That's where I was. So. What did you come to? What did you come to believe? I know when you started. Yeah. As you say, you, you were getting to the middle of the sculpture, what did you find inside yourself? Yeah, I like that. You're listening good. <laughs> well, 
let's think about it. If I said to you, who are the mellowest, coolest people we know? A lot of the guys in skating, it was the more Rastafari guys, whether they were black or white or whatever. And so, all right, I'm going to this Christian thrift store. I go in there and the guy right away says, hey, if you read this book, I'll give you more points on the anger management and the, and the thrift store. They said, if you go to the church and help make the fries and the cheeseburgers, I mean, there I am probably making as much money of everyone who works there and I'm serving burgers and fries at the church, but I loved it. I'm around people. I'm in America. I've got to get through this stuff. So they're giving me Christianity. I look to the rest of Far Eyes and right away, factually, rest of Far Eyes, the Bible comes down the Nile and becomes the Pibli. Is it the same God or not? I start studying that. Then you have Jehovah Witnesses who tell you that Jesus and Michael, the archangel, are the same person. Does the Bible teach that? Then you have Mormons who say that Jesus and Satan are brothers. Genesis says that the serpent, Satan, was the shrewdest of all the creatures that God created. But the Bible tells us that Jesus created all. So are they brothers or not? Then you look at all these different faiths. And here's the bigger question. What does God, which God talks about who you are, the state of our world, the consequences of how we live, and eternity? And most of these religions don't answer that. So I'm Listen, I have community service for seven months. I'm trying to disprove it. Mm -hmm. I'm watching all the History Channel shows on God and the ancient aliens. I've got this history of Eastern philosophy, and I'm starting to read the Bible. And here's what happened. And we got to get to the bottom of this even in starting. People will say, I don't believe the Bible because it was written by man. Well, you're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to go to a university to believe things written by man or woman. People say, you know, Jesus is a mystery. It's just like the Easter Bunny or Santa. Stay up on Christmas Day. And if you're under 20, 10, if you believe in Santa, I'm sorry to tell you, Santa is not showing up. Santa Claus never showed up in my life. Norma and George Sumner went and bought me Action Force or Ninja Turtles or whatever. Um, stay up on Easter and a bunny isn't showing up. But the Bible talks about having a faith in God where when you hear the news of his journey and what he did, He's the one that wakes you up. And what I mean is not enlightenment. It's not, it's not us being good enough and elevating ourselves and these practices and the universe. Here's the bottom line. And I'm saying this because you asked, what was it? I still wanted to be with this woman. My son was getting older. We're fully divorced. I'm on community service. I'm on probation. And I opened up Genesis 1. Genesis just means the beginning. Right there in the beginning of all you listeners, supposedly the God who loves us, what does he say? Let us make man in our image. So God claims that all of us listening, unless your cat and dog is, but all of all the humans were made in God's image. And I said, well, if I'm made in your image, God, why does my life suck? If you're God and you're good and I'm made in your image, why am I divorced? Why am I angry? Why so many fights growing up? Why many people dying? Why cancer? Why abuse? Why all these things? And so now we got a problem. Are we saying Adam and Eve were in the garden? Well, scientists today will tell you they believe we came from one set of parents. All our DNA carries, I would challenge everything. And what God says was, I put you guys in the garden, Adam and Eve, and you would have lived eternally with me. But I said, just don't eat of this tree. And we hear that and we think they went and ate an apple. It doesn't talk about an apple. Whatever they did that was sin, they didn't listen to God. They made a choice. They fell. And God says, in the day you do that, you, Brian, or you, John, or all of our listeners, you will die. And so we died spiritually and eventually physically. And that's the state of the world. I mean, are both you guys going to die one day? Well, of course, yeah. A hundred percent of all people are going to die. Why? Well, God says because of sin. Well, we're just human. We are. But we're born into a world where we'll lie or we'll cheat or we'll punch or we'll whatever. But isn't that all of mankind? It is. And so we're going to die. And so why didn't God do something about it? He did. He sent someone to die in our place so we could be forgiven. And this sounds crazy to people. If I was telling crude jokes, making fun of you guys, and slamming people, talking about fighters in the UFC or, or hating on my wife, but I was funny, we go, this is, oh, this is funny. But if you talk about God and our being made in his image, if you talk about it, and I don't mean white Jesus, Hollywood Jesus. I mean, if you talk about a God who for thousands of years spoke to the nation of Israel, people listening, this is history. Any historian, 
thousands of years of documents, scribe after scribe. If I'm your guy's dad, you learn the method. You don't miss a jot on a page on the papyrus. You give it to your kids and your kids, thousands of years of documents of prophecies of this coming person who would die, Jesus, all of it still exists today. There's like five pieces of evidence for Plato that he might have written, but we take it as fact. You're taught things in school and, you know, and we could go down the rabbit trail of all the the woke. I know you mess around with it, John, and all the rest of it. But the Bible has so much historical, geographical evidence. But the point is, it's all pointing to God saying, I spoke to Adam. I spoke to Abraham. I spoke to Moses and David, this lineage of people called the Old Testament. Then I got to the new and this promised coming Savior, Messiah. And here's why. You and I, guys, we can't save ourselves. Once I lied once, I'm a liar. Once I lusted once, there I am in adultery. If I'm so good, why am I going to die? I'm going to die because of this thing called sin. I'm not going to die of old age. No one ever has. We say it in Liverpool, oh, you know, she passed away in her sleep. God bless her. Something in her body failed. I mean, we're looking great. I'm waking up by now and I'm going on preaching a bit, but your body fails you. We're going to die because of the sin in this world. And at the end of it, God says, you're going to stand before him, give an account. And we're all guilty. How do I know I'm guilty? You guys both just told me you're going to die one day. Have you ever told a lie, guys? You're not raising your hand. You're lying right now, right? (laughs) So we're going to stand before God. And he says, we're guilty. Brian, that's so harsh. I know it is. But death is harsh. And so here's the picture. John, if you could see my youngest son right now and You could see on a camera, he was in the road skating and an 18 wheeler truck was coming just to kill him. Do you think as much fun as I'm having with you, I'm going to sit here and be like, oh, whatever, leave him. What would you want me to do? Throw this camera, run outside, dive in front of that truck and push him out the way, right? That's what God did with Jesus. We are already guilty of all this stuff. And what he did was sent Jesus to die on that cross, to shed his blood so we could all be forgiven And there's nothing we have to do. It's not religion climbing the mountain to God. It isn't multiple practices. That's called religion. It's that God so loved the world that he sent his son Jesus to die in our place and we could be forgiven. And so I'd heard all of that, but I didn't know God. I heard all of that. And I was still finishing the the community service. I almost got in a couple of the fights. And I came home one night to this house that I'm still in. And I went in this room behind me. And listen, I'd read the Bible in a lot of Hebrew, in Greek. I could quote it better than most Christians. And I went in that room. I got in a huge, and here's the thing. I would bought a house. I'd invited my ex-wife to live with me. And I said, I'm just going to stay with her till, I'm five, till my son's five or six. Because if I take my life then, at least he'll know I love him. And I came home that night. And so why am I talking about That's the place you were in, Brian, soon? yeah. You were that, that? You were, that's the place you were in at this point. Where I am right now. No, I'm, yeah. I mean, in your mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah. John, we're passive aggressive. Sadly, most people that take their lives, they get the phone call from the wife or something happens at work and they jump off the bridge on the way down. They're like, what am I doing? I mean, they study it. What's in the brain? This is how we are. It's like throw that punch and then, okay, is adrenaline. That's where I was. I have marks on my body. There's things if I had a gun, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. So as I'm in this room, I come home that day, fully divorced. Um, separated, hating life, still all known in the skate world. John could have looked me up and I'm doing Hollywood films and I'm making money and I'm getting checks for like 20, 30 grand a month. Like I didn't buy all this crazy stuff or chase things. I just wanted life. I just wanted to have a relationship and raise some kids. But I went in that room that's right here. My, My two kids are asleep in it right now. And I'm surprised they're not awake. And I got down on my knees. I said, God, I am over this. And see, in the Old Testament... They had so much reverence for God. God didn't give his name. He gave this thing called a tetragrammaton. And so his name, you know, many people call him Yehovah or Yahovah. I said, God, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I believe you created me. I believe the sin in the world. And it was the first time I was really going to him to save me and forgive me. All the other times it was, you know, if I ask you guys about prayer, what do you pray for your family or for God to do this and God to do that? We treat God as a genie, but that's not how God is in the Bible. I went in that room and said, God, I'll lay down my life. I'll give you my skating. I'll get baptized. And I'll remarry this woman. So sorry, Brian, this was the first time you said it was absolute conviction. You actually believed it now. 
This is Absolute the first time. conviction yeah. because I'd seen my sin. You see, and and for those who are listening and saying, man, this guy's going on, I'm intentionally doing this. I look at it <laughs> as a privilege to be here today, to be hanging out with you two. But I know God is going to speak to some people yeah, because man. in John 3, a man called Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And this man knows the word of God. He knows the Bible. And he comes to Jesus and he talks about who Jesus is. And Jesus says this statement. He says, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you are born again. And what he's saying is, John, um, for the listeners, you can't believe this till you hear of your fallen state and the work of God and God spiritually opens your eyes. And me coming from Liverpool, I'm just thinking, hey, at the end of it all, maybe Christianity's right, maybe Rastafari, maybe this, but that isn't what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches when you hear about your sin and that God sent this Messiah and you repent and say, I don't want to live this way. I need forgiveness. He says that you will spiritually come alive. So what that means is I was just living for me. The Bible says, what does it benefit man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? I was living a great life. Yeah, yeah. There was money. I could have chased women. We could have done whatever. If I'd have been on the podcast, then we'd have had millions of people. It's Brian at Skater from Liverpool, but I didn't know God. I knew about him, but I wasn't born again. And that's not a religion for those who think it is. What that means is John May hears this. So, so listen, God says we're born in this world. Our eyes are closed. Our ears are deaf. Our hearts are wicked. They just want to save ourselves. But when we hear of God's goodness, that he sent his son, that he ran out in the road and pushed my son Jude out the way. And that 18 wheeler crushed Christ, you could say. And afterwards he got up and rose again. That's the evidence that Brian loves his son. That's the evidence that God so loved as well that he sent Jesus, but I didn't know him yet. So when I was in this room, I said, God, I lay down my life. I give you this. I give you that. John, I'm at the top of my career. I'm in all the magazines and videos. I'm riding for the biggest companies. And this is the reality. If you want the scientific evidence, when people say, I don't believe the Bible, what's the scientific evidence? If I was on the Joe Rogan show right now, I'd say, Joe, you have to go to God on God's terms. What does that mean? Well, basically, God's the one telling you your state. And when you look at it and you hear it and you see what he did to his son and he rose again, that's the understanding that God sent Jesus on a rescue mission. So in that room, I said, I need forgiveness. Uh, and listen, as scientific as it is, he affirms it to you. I'm not saying every priest and the Pope and every supposed believer in God is a Christian, has become born again, has been forgiven, is spiritually alive. What I'm saying is to the person that has been forgiven, they know, and they're not the same. Something happened to me in 2004 in that room where I knew the presence of God, the power of God. I was forgiven, as it says biblically. What Jesus said to Nicodemus, are your eyes open? They opened. I fell on the floor laughing and crying for 40 minutes saying, I can't believe this is real. I thought of my friends in England. I thought of my sisters, my parents. Why did no one tell me about this? Why have I hit? And even this whole Bruce Lee philosophy Within seconds, it just it was gone. Sense. It was like, I, I knew. I just knew, John, and it changed everything. I came out the room, got in bed next to my ex-wife. She sits up like a zombie at one in the morning, repeats all these things I've been praying that she has no idea about for 10 minutes, goes to sleep. And the next day in this room, I said, I'm going to follow God. I'm going to give him my skating. I'm going to get baptized. And she's like, you know, you're crazy. You're not even this. You're not even that. I followed him for three weeks. She had a crazy experience three weeks later. We were remarried three months later. And then my son who ju just left is 20 and is getting married in what? In a month, I'm doing the marriage. And my two kids, Eden's 14 in the room next to me and Jude's almost 11. So here's the deal. He showed up and I gave him my skating. I got baptized right where, you know, when you guys come over, you'll come visit Huntington where my mom's ashes got scattered and where I asked my wife to marry me, where we got baptized. And so now I'm this Christian. I have this skate career. Life changes. And we'll have had 21 years of marriage this December. And that's it. It's crazy. God made himself very known. And so my hope is just people will say, wait a minute. Because I'd ask anyone. But what, what did that what feeling feel like, Brian? Was there an over, overwhelming sense of love? Is that what it was? Because that's what it, I've heard it described as. Well, 
Peter, and I, I'm using scripture because you can hear my testimony, people, but God says in Isaiah 55, 11, who's a prophet, Isaiah, when the word goes out, it doesn't return void. And Jesus told Nicodemus, the spirit of God moves like the wind. So anyone that's hearing this and go, man, I have lied. I have lusted. I do need forgiveness. That's God working. And in this room, John, I know we had this conversation when we've talked, you know, many times over the years. I can't explain it other than I instantly knew my eyes were opened. And that's what he says, because Nicodemus says, how can I be born again? And he said, how are you a teacher in Israel? How do you not understand? And Nicodemus says, do I have to go back inside my mother? And he says, no, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So here's the thing. We're born once and we're going to die, but then we get judged again and we're guilty. Or we're born again, which is what Christianity is. I was forgiven that day. I became a new creation. That's what the Bible says. So I got Brian in me. I still want to say things I shouldn't. I still think of things I shouldn't. That's going to be the rest of yeah, my yeah. life. Christianity isn't that we're perfect and I have the right Bible and I judge everyone. Christianity is I just know that dad sent his son into the road to push me out the way. And I'm taking as many people as I can. But the actual feeling was it's like nothing I could explain. It was like, I just knew right then that, that everything I'd read was true, that, that everything I'd wrestled with. I mean, the Bible talks about unicorns. You have leading atheists today. You go, Oh, unicorns in the Bible. Yeah. Well, the word unicorn, there wasn't another word at the time. And one all horn. it means is a one horn rhinoceros. We talk about how long people have been. They look at the timeline. So he showed up. I knew it was God. I, I just knew and in 2004, my life changed. And see, I, I I spoke to you about this last year. Like I, I yeah. was I was having a really, you know, I've, I've always spoke to Brian, and I've you know I've always struggled with religion. You've always I've well God's of course. Yeah, I've yeah. always challenged, and I always challenge it, and blah blah blah, because I want to believe it's real, but then yep. there's certain things that make me think, but it can't be. But I do always think of you, Brian, because I think Brian, you know, as I said before. <laughs> but anyway, I was in a really bad relationship. And yeah. it, it, it took it out of me, man. It just, it wore yeah. me down to a nub. And um, I yep. opened up to Billy Moore. Billy Moore's from the Billy Does Podcast and stuff. And Billy yep. Billy went to this meeting and he went, just come along with me. Just, just, it's just, just nice people there and whatever else. Yeah. And um, I just went along <laughs> just to oh, get a bit inspired and blah, blah, blah. And I just spent time with Billy. I opened up to Billy and he took me to one of these meetings. He went to, I just tagged along. And at the yeah. end of it, I was listening to all these people's stories. But something else happened leading up to the day. Yeah. No, but actually what happened earlier on the day, um, I don't really cut hair in the barbers anymore. And I was cutting a vicar's hair. And I was yeah, talking I think you to told me some of this. I did, go ahead, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it, goes, it goes before that again. But anyway, so I speak cutting this vicar's hair. I don't usually cut hair. And I'm speaking yeah. to him. And at the end of the year, because he said, you know what? That was so refreshing. Because yeah. I was speaking, I'm speaking to someone who was challenging me. And I said yeah. to him, what? What makes you believe in it? I mean, yeah. what makes you believe in it? Blah, blah, blah. And he went, I'm only human, John. I said, and I got into this and, you know, went to learn to be a vicar and I done all this. He said, but when my kids were born, that's what mm -hmm. confirmed it for me because I had this yeah. overwhelming sense of love. And he said, yeah. he has always challenges it, but he said, that's when I knew. But anyway, yeah. that day when I went yeah. with Billy in this meeting, everyone hugs each other at the end. And there was this fella who was, he looked homeless. He's someone I probably usually wouldn't have given time to. And I might have yeah. walked past him and, you know, he looked undesirable. And he come over and walked towards me and went to hug me. Yeah. And I hugged him back. Now, here's this <laughs> man who I'd never have, I would never have hugged this man, but I've yeah. never, I, that's when I had a moment. I had this overwhelming sense of love Amen. from this absolute stranger. And that's the first, you said, it, you talk about scientific, but that, you said it confirms it to you. It's I'm, very personal, John. It's very about you because, and, and look, I'm going to say well, this. I, I, I want you to. I yeah. still struggle now, so I'm I'm yeah. still trying to, is to it navigate. Me to, yeah. So you know, for you to do it twenty odd years later and to stay strong with it, you must have you must have got a real good hit. It, <laughs> it, 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 well, like, first of all, I mean, it was a vicar. I don't even know that most vicars have hair, but that was pretty cool. <laughs> but um, but I'll tell you this. Here's what it's like. Um, if I hold up a wallet and I said, John, there's $30 in here. Okay. Is there or not? Do you know or not? No. You don't. I'm just saying you that have faith it. there is or faith there isn't. How are you going to know? 
By opening only, the wallet. <laughs> that's the only way. Yeah. So if you want to talk about God, and I'll say if Joe Rogan, and I, and I know a lot of his atheist friends and different people, if you want to talk about God, the God of the Bible, who claims he created you, Genesis 126, were made in his image. Your dog wasn't, your cat wasn't. Hey, we're meant to take care of all these creatures, but you were made in his image. If you want to know that God, you have to open up the Bible yeah. and you have to realize, like I said, there's thousands of years of papyrus. Yeah. This isn't like some guy that wrote it and people say, well, we could start a religion. Start one then. Start one and see 300 prophecies. I mean, you can go into science and study Ezra, Nehemiah, dates. It's all there. It's all there. But you have to go yourself. And so here's the thing. That person walking up to you today, I mean, that was just love. Here's this person. When I came to faith, I went to a church that was heavy recovery. And these were people that would be strung out and on drugs and, and really having a hard time that their family was praying for. And they'd show up to me. And I'm just so excited for what God did. And I grab hold of them. And this is a person that no one in their family's touched for three years because they've been robbing from everyone on heroin. And then they they feel this feeling that you felt just from another human God, we were made to walk in love. We're made to be a family, but we have sin and we're against each other and there's opposition. So I would have the privilege of seeing this guy come back who was on heroin and his parents are coming and they're like, we can't believe this and him feeling this. But the point is we need, we're all going to die and we need to enter eternity having been forgiven. And for someone listening, listen, the Bible said the road is narrow. We're distracted by everything. We chase things. We want to thrive. It's about making money. It's about chasing the next woman. It's about being the top of the game. These are all idols we have in our lives. And God isn't opposed to you having things. Have the biggest podcast in the world. Submit the most people in the gym. Grind the biggest handrail. Make money. But God is first because, look, he's our heavenly father. And I'm not this guy that... You know, I don't chase all these different things. I understand Christians have missed it. If you're looking for me to be perfect, I'm going to try and live that way. I'm not going to aim to cheat on my wife. I don't need to lie to you guys. I don't want, why? Because I love God. It's not because God's, I mean, he's going to judge us if we're not in Christ, but because of what he did. And, and John, you know this. I mean, so what's more of value now that I have the most tricks in the magazine or make the most money or that I get to be on a podcast and tell people about God's love? And I hope some people will hear this and they'll open the Bible themselves or they'll message me and say, I had that crazy interview where you think you're American and, <laughs> and I want to talk to you about God. I hope people do that, you know? So, but, but anyway, but for you guys though, so when your friend said to you, you know, oh, you going to church because you're gay, what did you say? I, just, I was, uh, couldn't, couldn't bend my head around it. It's just like, <laughs> no, but what I found, Brian, I was similar to you. I, 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 I yeah. always believed that the truth is somewhere in the middle. So I got the, I read the Bible, I read the Quran, I read the secret, yes. and it all, it all had the yeah. original source, you know what I mean? The, the God, and, and one thing I, I, I struggle, not struggle with, yeah. God is number one and first in my life foremost, you know, thank you, Jesus. I, I choose Amen. to, choose to follow the faith of a Catholic, but what I do, what I do wonder is like, God, yeah. was, God was created in that. We were created in God's image. What does yeah. God? What does God look like in your imagination? Because in mine, yeah, I can't fathom it. How? How? What's your imagination? Yeah. Well, if you look at Daniel, the Bible talks in Daniel seven, and it talks about God, who's the Ancient of Days. So He's this being that's there. And it says, one like the son of man came to him. And the son of man is a reference to Jesus. He's going to be born 2,000 years ago, and he's going to live. You know, it's like this, and it sounds stupid, but I'll say it. If you want to go out in the backyard and start speaking to your cat, they have no idea pretty much what you're saying unless you become a cat. Well, how is God going to speak to us? Yes, he spoke through his word, but he had to become wrapped in the flesh. So in the Old Testament, no one could see God and lived. He was so pure. He was so perfect. It's called the Shekinah glory of God. So Israel would follow him and he would be in this cloud or this pillar of fire and they would go to sacrifice animals. And, you know, all our vegans like my wife is or vegetarians in, in Liverpool. I like it's so barbaric. The point of all these sacrifices was that we're given something of value to this God to show him reverence. But these were all a picture of thousands of years later the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus. 
It wasn't ever about the lamb. It wasn't ever about the goat. That's why when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist, his cousin said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we have this picture in the Old Testament of God and this Shekinah glory, which if you see, you will drop dead. It's completely perfect. We're fallen beings. We would die. And so what does God do? He sends angels, which by the way, for those listening, angels aren't chubby little beings with little wings, you know, that wouldn't hold them up for nothing flying around on birthday cards. That's yeah, they are dominant looking beings. They are made, created. They are just messenger. Even the word alien, just a messenger. So when you have people showing up in civilizations, I believe it's always angels, God's messengers. God would send them. And then in Daniel 7, my point was, we see Jesus coming and it talks about his hair white like wool, his eyes, his feet like bronze. He's perfect. And here's why this is crazy. When God made Adam, it says he took him from the dead of the air. That's why we hear in many of, you know, the readings at funerals from dead they came to dead they will remain. The real color that's quoted there was an off red. And if you think about all the colors of the world, everyone's fighting over race. Well, we came from the color of dirt. I mean, is that white to you? I'm more like an off mocha. We're all just variations of what God created. But now you get to the New Testament and John says, behold, the Lamb of God. And what it tells us is he is the light of the world. And this is what it means. The book of Hebrews said, in Christ, the fullness of the glory of God dwells. So when you've seen Jesus, you've seen his earthly representation in the flesh, and we wouldn't die seeing it. But when we get to heaven, we're going to look at God. And Daniel says, there's parts of, there's a body. We're made in his image. And that, and that word is imago Dei, in God's image. So male, female, we're made in God's image. So we have to look at ourselves and say, there's something about us that resembles God. Yeah. We're his children. But when we see him, I mean, like we used to think growing up, you know, is it the spaghetti monster? Is it this? Is it that? The Bible claims to be the truth. And that's why even, you know, when you mentioned the Quran, the Quran teaches it was Judas that was on the cross, not God. Or you have Muhammad who had all the scrolls, and when they got destroyed, he went and made him again. But as soon as he died, who's the, who's the authority? With the nation of Israel and the, and the Bible, you have all these scholars and scribes and rabbis who've been trained, who know. And then, the, you know, the church is birthed in the book of Acts. So to look upon God, you're going to see the face of Christ. Because there's three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, yeah and, and he's a personal God. Like John said, you you will have your experience with him, and, and you're never the same. Yeah. Any of my friends I went to school with are like, wow, either Brian's gone crazy or exactly what the Bible says has happened to him. And, John, you know this. The podcast I do is called Foolishness because Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church, says this message is foolishness. To talk about a living God who loves you, died and resurrected, is foolishness to the world. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So, yeah. yeah. To, to, to somebody from where I'm from, if you're if you're a Muslim, a radical Muslim, you mm -hmm. you blow people up. If you're a Christian and you're a radical Christian, you've lost your marbles. It's crazy, isn't yep. it? We're all judged. But as you say, Brian, if, if you know, you can relate to it, you can relate, can't you? And there's a lot of people out there who can. So there's a lot of people out there probably judging us right now, but I think we have of lost course. our marbles. But, you know, thank you, Jesus. He said that. He said, you'll be hated for my name's yeah. sake. But here's the thing. If you showed up to me on the top of my skate career and going, oh, listen to him. He's lost his mind. He sounds mm -hmm. crazy, you know. It does sound crazy. But like I said, we can tell crude jokes. We can take advantage of people. We can sleep with someone's wife. We can get smacked out of our heads. For some reason... We tolerate this, but you mentioned Jesus, it messes with people. You can make fun of Jesus and God, every movie, blaspheming, but you said that about Muhammad, stuff's going to go down. Yeah, yeah. You say that about other gods, you're being hated. So my point is in this world, God is degraded every day. I mean, oh my G-O-D, we're doing it to him already. And the point is, Jesus's name, you know, Yeshua, Yoshua, Jesus is Joshua. But we have the the pronunciation Jesus, or a lot of my Mexican friends here, you know, Jesus. But it's as simple as God in the flesh, and He lived, died, and resurrected. And I'll tell you guys, for some of you guys who were up late, like I know John will talk at times, go look up the real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia, dude. The mountain that Moses was on, it's there where Elijah sacrificed the cave. It's all there, but you're not going to see it because it's all locked away. 
We're living in a fallen world where God says there's going to be an adversary that aims to deceive you. And I'm just going to be crazy for a minute, John, because surely your listeners who love conspiracy are like, oh, my gosh, this is blowing my mind. Genesis 6 talks about fallen angels coming down, impregnating women, and basically going out and deceiving the world. And you're like, what are you talking about, lad? Well, everyone that thinks it's aliens coming down doing that and messing with people, it's not extra dimensional. It's extra, not extra terrestrial. It's extra dimensional. So all these abductations and people getting impregnated and false religions, if God says we need forgiveness, then what the enemy's done, sent a bunch of fallen angels, the world's gone crazy, and it's everywhere. So I'm here and I have no problem someone saying this guy's crazy because when we stand before God, you're going to be like, man, thank you, Brian, for preaching the truth. If I was there in Liverpool and you got hit by a car on the side of the road, I can love you all day, bro. I can be there with you, hold your hand, call your loved one, but I want you to know God. When I came home to my mom, who right there in Penny Lane, staying with my sisters, was dying of cancer, and I went home and spent time with her for five days on her deathbed, Mom, you heard Billy Graham preach. Mom, you've seen my life. You've seen what God did, but I can't heal you. I can't stop what is happening to your body. But mom, I need you to know God. I need you to know he sent his son who died for us. And she believed and she trusted and she passed away the next day. And I can rejoice. My wife miscarried three weeks later and I can rejoice. Why? Because my mother in heaven met my unborn child before I did. And I have that confidence because of Christ, because when he died in the grave, he got up again. He resurrected, proving there's an afterlife and that we can be forgiven. So call me crazy, but guys, um, come to America. You'll meet a lot of people like me. <laughs> and I'm going to go do jujitsu today, skate today, hang out. Dude, nothing's changed, but God, that's it. So, and anyone listen, you want to talk to me, hit me up. I will make the time. I want people, especially who is wrestling with stuff, marriages, strung out, hating God. Let's talk. Do you find, so. do you find Brian, that it gives you a better purpose in life when you do understand that in your heart there's going to be an afterlife and you have to answer to these consequences? Like you said before, I've got no reason to lie. I've got no reason to be adulterous. Do you believe <laughs> that if everyone had this mindset, the world would be a better place? Yeah, of course, because, I mean, even in America right now, you've got all this politics and everyone's supposedly this and supposedly that. I don't even see color like that. Why? Because God made us all. You look at Noah. I mean, you talk about Ham, Shem, Japheth, his children. They went out. All these people must have looked different. I mean, I don't care who you are. If me and my wife have kids, 100 kids, they're not going to look Asian. I don't care who you are. You get a family that's predominantly this or that. It's it's going to vary to a degree, but God made people individually like this. So we're the human race. We're called to love everyone. And I'm not called to go here and judge everyone. The Bible actually says, don't judge the world because we know we're all guilty. Mm. But I'm called to judge myself. Or if you and John are sitting there saying, oh, you know, I'm going to go do this behind my wife's back. No, you don't need to do that. Man, God loves you. That's not what's best for you. That's not going to help your family. That's what Christianity is and pointing to Christ. But the world has spun it that, you know, the church just wants your money. And sadly, a lot of the tragic things that have happened in churches. And But, you know, you put any man in a position of power, and, and that's what's going to happen. We have to stay humble, you know, and the Bible daily speaks to us, hold us accountable. So so I heard you saying there before that you're going to be marrying your son. Um, so you went yeah. off to be a preacher, didn't you, Brian? I went to Bible school, did stuff online. And right when I came to faith, people started inviting me. Could you come share your story? So I just started reading and got into the Hebrew and the Greek. And listen, I mean, what's sad in America is a lot of pastors and preachers went to seminary to avoid the war. So were they really going as Christians that the spirit of God really filled them? I came to faith and now I travel, do a lot of preaching, teaching. I'll be on the East Coast in about a month where I'll preach three or four times. I'll probably preach twice in the next few weeks. People yeah. hit me up to do that. And I do that podcast to reach people and um I mean, even jujitsu, I'm in the gym to reach all these people. I go around the world doing missions trips and partnering with churches. And I was meant to come over to England all before COVID hit. You know, I'm always in Cornwall every year doing big Christian festivals. But yeah, I'm definitely more of an evangelist. You know, you're always talking about the gospel and reaching people. Yeah. So there's a process that goes with it, though, isn't it, Brian? Because a lot of people don't know where we're from. How would you become a priest or whatever? What is the process? I've often wondered myself. Well, all people would think of is 
what they see maybe in the Catholic faith. And a lot of Catholics, they believe the Bible, they trust the Bible, but sadly for many years, it was read in Latin so people couldn't read it. You know, it was just whatever a priest said. But in Christianity, here's the thing, right? Every one of us is a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. But the second you confess Jesus as Lord, you are forgiven and you become a saint. A saint isn't something that the church says and gives you a statue and a, and a window pane and there's St. Brian, St. whatever. I get it. People reverence men, but I'm a saint. You're a saint if you believe. That's it. And so for me as a minister, you'd say, um, I don't need to wear all these garments, do all this stuff. I need to spend time with God. I mean, Jesus was a teacher that walked the earth, called 12 followers, you know, started with the fishermen. They didn't have any school, any teaching, but the spirit of God was in them and they understood Jesus's teaching and they went out and proclaimed. He said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. He called them to go into the world and continue these teachings. So for you, if you were like, I'm going to go do this, you're just going to go to church. You're going to do some Bible school. You're going to read. Do you know the text? Can you give an argument for the hope you have? That's Christianity, you know? And then obviously you have a setup, but that's, Christianity is very different than a lot of people understand, you know? So yes, I'm a pastor and I'm ordained and I can perform ceremonies, and but I'm an evangelist. You know, our, our church supports what I do and and, and, and partners with me. And, and I don't know even the picture you probably have at the church, but I mean, most of the guys there do jujitsu, a lot of skaters, surfers, well, musicians. Say, I mean, you always said to me, it's like God will give you a gift, and then if you use this yeah. gift and harness it and whatever, you can spread the words of God with it. So it's like, I know you do skate Bible. Is that yours, yeah. Brian? Yeah, that, and that's just, you know, that's just, John, I come to faith, and all my friends are. They're going through midlife crises. They're getting divorced. They're hating God. They don't want to live. And I'm like, how do I reach them? So I put a little movie out, you know, skate Bible film called Foolishness that unpacks the gospel. I went and traveled at a bunch of skate ministries so my friends could hear this message. So, you know, the apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church, said, you need to become all things to all men. So if I'm working in Sheep's Barbershop, I want to be the Christian in there that respects my boss, loves on my wife, hangs out with that vicar, yeah. hangs out with the guy who's cracked out. I'm just there to be an epistle. I mean, I'm just there to live for God. So whether it's a podcast, whether you're an accountant, whether you're, I mean, I just have Benil Dariush on my podcast, you know, one of the top 10 UFC fighters. And that's what he's, that's his realm. Yeah, it's yeah. not about if you're a preacher in the sense of a title because the Bible teaches we shouldn't think of ourselves that more, nor, you know, as highly as we ought. So. Yeah, well, Brian, thank you so much. Today, and thank you for using your position of influence to spread the message of God. Of course, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. I mean, this one is quite different from the rest, but it's been, it's been great. Really enjoys it, Brian. It's like, yeah, I mean, what, what, what are we normally talking about? I we, mean, do, we just, you know, no, yeah, yeah. But, but this, uh, this is, this has been a good shake up and a good change. Well, you know, like here's it. the thing too, John. I mean, you know, there was a time when I was angry and bitter and I look back on my life and I was like, man, you know, growing up in Liverpool um, around a lot of families that were in gangs and this and that and, and getting into so many fights. And I was like, man, if everyone backed it, I want to go see this person or do whatever. Just me being a kid, like, you know, because of who someone's family is or what they are. And it's kind of like you have this chip on your shoulder where you're like, life's driving me crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then with skating and divorce, and I was like, just angry and hurt. And then you come to faith and you're like, man, for me, I mean, I just told my wife yesterday, I get to go on this podcast with, first of all, John, and then I mean, obviously both of you and the crew, but I'm going to get to talk to people that I'm never going to see again, potentially from school who are going through hell and people that I, I rub, you know, faces with back in the day. Yeah. The dude I love, I hope when COVID goes down, I'll be able to go preach in some of those great churches in Liverpool and travel and, and get to share people because it took me to get divorced yeah. and pretty much be suicidal to, to think, is there a bigger picture? There is and be, so, there you is know, be people it, who, who maybe forgot like that lads who lived on our roads and they're going to see it, you know, through our podcast and going like, no way it's fucking Brian Sumner. And hopefully it will influence them. Um, what was I going to say then? Oh, I, had, I had a little gem then, but it's fucking gone out of me. Head. Say whatever. I hope oh. you have a name. Yeah. No, it's gone out of me head, Brian. Oh, I was going to say something really good. I've been sitting there for about 20 Well, minutes. here's the thing though. I want to know, is Darren Till from Walton? Yeah, he's from County Road, yeah. See, 
I've known Dana for years. I, my vice is UFC. If I could have gone back, I wouldn't have even skated. I would have done MMA. I love yeah, it. I so when Darren that. came out and the whole team Caban and all those guys, you know, um, and then the, the, what, Sweet Caroline, I'm like, I wanted to get back to Liverpool. I know you're friends with a lot of those guys as well. But I just wanted to know, was he from Walton? You yeah, know, so. Yeah, we've got so many good fighters here. There's another girl called Meatball, Molly McCann, Chris Yeah, Fischel. I just seen a fight last week, so two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah there's loads, loads of... Scouts. Well, from Walton, you mean? From Liverpool. Yeah. Local. No, but you saying about Darren. Well, Darren's from Delamore Street. Crazy. I know. Well, I remember Terry Etham, and then your friend who's in all the John May, you know, not the calm version we see now, but all the crazy videos that come out. Um, that's just cool. Because, I mean, I think Liverpool needs that, you know. And I know from what Dana's always talked about is, like, Liverpool's just one of those cities, biggest, you know, soccer football teams in the world. Yeah. And who was the guy who just fought? Oh, the big guy that looks like Frank Mir. He just knocked out Andre Olovsky. What was his name? Did you guys see it last week? I don't know. I just see it that's myself. You know, your, your don't, don't, don't watch it myself. <laughs> yeah. Wait, support, you're from Liverpool? I just support, yeah. the local, support the local fighters, you know. I don't really watch him. Jazz is yeah. going for the world title in a couple of weeks. I don't know if you know much about Jazz, but Jazz obviously being in America. Jazz is a boxer. And what yeah, going, yeah, that's what crazy. Are, what are you going for next week? Yeah, the IBF world title. I don't know if you follow the boxing, but the IBF world title. Crazy. Yeah. I, I, I heard about Jake Paul calling out Ben Askren, but no, I do. I can't keep up with boxing enough, but yeah. John was saying that that's crazy. Congratulations. So, <laughs> but what I was saying, what, what I was going to say, Brian, was like, here's you, a guy, you know, successful yeah. in life, but obviously you were frustrated and there were certain things you didn't feel fulfilled. And then yeah. you found religion by proving it wrong to yourself and proving it wrong yeah. to everyone else and not to where the spark happens for you. Yeah. Yeah. Which and is that should amazing. be, you know, you owe it to yourselves. I mean, if, if, if I mean, I would say, think about it. This book claims it will change your life. And listen, there's things in there that people aren't going to understand. You know, you read about slavery, you're going to picture it in today's context. You're not going to understand that back then, like if you two guys, you know, if you didn't win the world title and there's you, John, with your kids and and you guys don't have anything, I go, well, do you want to come work for me? My responsibility is to pay your bills, take care of your family, do whatever. So even slavery was a way to love on people. And obviously people abused it. But if you get into the Bible and read it for yourself, and here's why, you know, you guys all know the Narnia books and C.S. Lewis. Um, if I'm really made for him and I can only be satisfied in, in being fulfilled in the Lord, then all this other stuff that I'm trying to be satisfied by, it's all going to be a trap and an addiction. I'm going to need one more woman to sleep with, one more fix, one more deal, one more fight, yeah. one more submission, yeah. whatever it is. And a lot of those things can be good. I mean, use your boxing career, you know, John, use the podcast, whatever you guys are doing. But ultimately, if I'm made by him, I can only truly be satisfied. And John, you alluded to this a minute ago when you talked about a platform. Yeah, the book of Ephesians says for God's workmanship. So this microphone should be used or it doesn't find its identity. This phone should be used, doesn't find its identity. Every person's made by him, not just to sit and shake and say, oh God, we're meant to worship him, walk with him, love people, go into the streets, reach people, connect with people, help people. So that's it, you know, see people come over their addictions and the rest. And yeah. <laughs> Brian. Yes. It's been absolutely lovely to see your little face and thank you very much for coming on. And I'm sure this podcast is going to go be very interesting, go down very well. Thank you so much for your time, Brian, and for your insights. Well, stoked to meet you, of course. Yeah, and John, you guys, listen, anytime, because maybe you'll get a thousand questions and we can just do a follow-up question, because I know, you know, you're as ambiguous as I am, John, whatever opens up. So yeah. I just hope for people listening who I haven't seen for years, love you all. It's great talking to you. Um, skating's been fun, loving the jiu-jitsu, raising up the family. But um, life can be crazy and tough. And when you go into dark places, um, please let people know, reach out, get a hold of me, John, these guys, everyone. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, got, you very much. Have guys. you got, uh, got any questions, oh, sorry. guys? Go on, yeah, yeah. got any questions, uh, just leave them in the comment section below and we could do a part two, whatever that may be. Even if, you know, we'll have a laugh about it, whatever, just answer, ask your questions in the comments. And before you go, Brian, sorry, I know I've said to that about three times. Where can people reach you where can people you know watch your platforms and stuff yeah uh, briansumner.net someone owns.com won't give it to me <laughs> briansumner.net has everything and then I'm on Instagram just with my name and then 
Foolishness podcast. I'm about a hundred episodes in and I just interview guests, talk about stuff, or I travel a lot. You might see me somewhere, you know, so anything. Hit me up though, but I'm there. So if anyone needs anything, I'll be there. Brian, thank you very much. Love you guys. And you. Cheers, mate. <laughs>Faster Car Finance provide a smooth, hassle-free way for you to apply for car finance and to get the vehicle of your choice. Whether you have good or bad credit, no deposit is required. A decision is reached within minutes and one of our dedicated finance advisors will be available to discuss your requirements. Apply now at www.fastercarfinance.co.uk.